Hello, 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 beautiful people. Welcome, bright, breezy, bold. It's time to create a life you adore. Thank you for being here. Today, we have an incredible guest. I'm really excited about interviewing the wonderful Christopher Hoffman. Christopher is many, many things, including uh, an author, an artist, he spent time as a creative engineer, and I'm dying to find out more about all of that. Um, and he has only produced innovative products, but he's actually achieved international recognition as a startup senior CEO and pioneering designer. And he, the, the phrase he uses, which I adore, is, I walk life. And Christopher walks life as an innovator on the road to inner peace, which is very important to me. We'll be delving into that in the episode. But he's going to share and talk about taming his overachiever by learning to ask for what he wants and discovering that guess what is not a conversation? No, is not a conversation. And how our inner peace actually allows our, our human nature to be the most ancient and effective operating system to live by. And I want to know more about that. Did you learn that the hard way? I want to discover. But I'm going to hand the mic over to you, Christopher. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Well, you know, the whole theme of um, building a life you adore is, you know, at the, at the foundation of it is, are you happy? Are you happy in what you're building and, and what you're uh, surrounding yourself with? So for me, it, there's been a long evolution towards just being this kind of overachiever. It's all about me. Uh, you know, am I valued kind of inner, you know, noise to a place where it just doesn't matter. I'm going to do what I want to do, but yet I'm going to invite other people to play along with me. So the, the leader isn't to try to you know, ma manipulate people into doing what I want them to do. It's, it's to actually have a vision and consistently move towards a goal and invite people to come along. I, I love the posse feeling of I've got my people close by and they're all very talented. And I've done a lot to surround myself by the best people because I'm ambitious and I'm competitive. So what I'm moving towards isn't some acquisition or some uh, monetary gain. It's to just be in the flow of going towards a goal that requires solving problems that I'm actually interested in solving. I love it. I love it. So I've got, I've got a couple of questions that come from that. I'm curious to know where in the world I logically know, because I obviously read this, but where in the world are you? And have you managed to build those connections, um, I suppose, virtually and online? I'm only asking because I'm a bit of a, a, no, a nomad at the moment. And I'm, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like nomad, tell me about it. I grew up uh, north of Detroit, uh, left high school and, and started engineering, uh, at an uh, engineering firm um, building machinery for the auto industry. And at night I'm playing bass guitar in a punk rock band. So I did that for 15 years and then moved to New York in the late eighties to follow a music career and ended up building sets for Broadway shows and then got married, went back to Detroit uh, for a couple of years, had my daughter and moved out to Portland, Oregon uh, for almost 20 years, restored an old arts and crafts bungalow and did the whole family thing. And then realized you're with the wrong person once you start waking up and really wanna participate in life. And so I left that and, and you know, got rented a little room in a house and, and started on a journey towards my own self-evolution and my hero's journey. And you know, there's, there's a few women that I met along the way that taught me so much more about myself and how to um, you know, actually respect women and actually respect my role in a relationship and, and to get clear about, you know, am I looking for outside approval or, or am I more self-aware and, and self-motivated. So there's all these shadowy kind of unconscious habits that one has to finally get over to a point where I can see a bigger landscape and then just 
after that, um, I started a company and raised two and a half million dollars and, and started up this one wheel electric motorcycle company. And that went totally viral, total geek fest, 24 million views on my YouTube videos. And you know, it was on national tele TV and, and Discovery Channel and did a TED talk. And, and then we ran out of money, you know, so I just ended up in another little apartment and I sort of wrote a book about it and um, just somehow managed to keep some cash flow going and ended up back in New York. And, and the thing that led me up to where I am today is I'm literally in New York working on a one man show to promote my book. And in the crescendo of this one man show is this huge costume that I wanted to build that somehow signified the human, the struggle of human nature and COVID hit. So COVID hits and nobody's going to the theater. The theaters are closed. And I'm in my apartment in Brooklyn, like, oh man, like now what? And I just got on my thinking cap and I said, so what can I make out of what's around me now? Who am I? What do I want to do next? So I just, I remember there was this buddy of mine who had a cabin on the West Coast near an old growth forest. And I had this costume idea and I, and that for some reason, I still can't even remember why, I had this question of if mother nature dressed up in a huge costume, what would it look like? So what would mother, mother nature, what would mother nature look like? So I decided I'm gonna shoot this little art film and I'm gonna answer that question. So just get in my car, drive to this, my buddy said, yeah, if you wanna stay in my cabin, great. You know, I'm, we're building a greenhouse, help us out. You know, So I'm at this coast, you know, laying in a hot tub, looking at the sun go down and imagining this thing. So I built this costume and we're shooting it in the, in the woods and running around with lighting and realize you can't follow mother nature around in the woods with lighting. So I built all the lighting into the costume and then realized, you know, it's, it's bright, but it's still not good enough. And so I used some of the technology from my, my earlier company and put an accelerometer in the middle of this costume. And then as she moves, the color of her costume is changing oh. depending on how she moves. And so I, I developed this technology and, and then I'm like, that's awesome, but I should make a product out of it. You know, like, I don't know if I wanna do this art film. So I came up with this little, this wristband that changes color depending on how you move. So I baked all of that technology into this, wow. this like light up wristband that knows where the center of the earth is. And it's just this wacky little simple product that I'm launching now. And, and so I just took the same people, my software guy and you know my 3D printer guy and some Asian relationships and <laughs> You just reconfigure it all, and you're now I'm going in this completely different direction. And I'm going to do an umbrella. Can you imagine an umbrella where there's this light that changes color with an umbrella, like I'm spinning it around in Central Park? Oh and, no! Right, and then I pop it, and it turns bright, and I can shoot selfies, you know, with like my Instagram people. And then if you're in a dark alley and you, you're walking in this pool of light with your umbrella. It's not dark anymore. Look at you right. bringing the light to the shadows. <laughs> global, I know that's a global product. So what I do in my life is I put these things out in front of me. And I think to myself, if I could stick that together with that and then make that happen, wouldn't that be awesome? And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but if I could do that, that would be just exciting for the sense of it. So then you start talking to people that have skills that would love to be part of that. And they start to believe in you because you're just doing it. And I'm building prototypes. I mean, I'm literally building prototypes in my like kitchen, you know, on the table and like soldering shit together. And, and I get my CAD program on, I design all this stuff and I send it to people and and eventually you, you end up with this little team of people like, dude, like, let's do this. You know, I mean, yeah. and, I, and you just keep finding that stuff shows up in your email box. You're like, how did they find me? Like, what did I do? What, what little video did they see? And you just keep, it's like popping bass hits out into right field. You know, I will work my way around the bases. I don't have to hit a home run. It's just, it's not, it's not about, you know, being a hero. 
It's just consistently solving little problems that I'm kind of fascinated by. And it's a lifestyle. So it's, it's really like there's so much space, you know, in my life and so much wow. possibilities in my life right now that I, I, you know, it's just like, I don't know what's coming, I, but it's all exciting. And I don't have the stress. There's no stress. Um, does that make sense? Oh my God, it does. And I adore it. So much space. Just you saying those words, I felt myself expand. I felt myself deep breathing. It's just beautiful. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the unknown and the hero's journey. You, know, you, 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 you touched briefly on the hero's journey earlier. And I would imagine you're someone that's quite happy living in the unknown. There's... You know, obviously, you're this, you're an incredible, not only an incredibly gifted artist and creator, but and not but and you spent time to, as the the words at the entrance to the Delphi uh, temple in Greece, the Apollo temple, uh, know thyself. You spent a lot of time on that journey. So I guess what I'm curious about is, you know, what stage of the hero's journey are you at? Or do you even, re do you relate to the hero's journey? Um, yeah, well, the, the hero's journey is a great metaphor. And I'll tell you a great story. Um, when I, I first left my marriage, I, well, the truth is I dated a total narcissist for like three years and I had no idea what I was getting into. And, and to get clear with my no, you know, like there's, Finally, to get to a point where you close the door tight, you know, it's not a conversation. I don't have to worry about hurting somebody's feelings to take care of myself. When I'm disrespected, it's no and radio silence. So there's this, there's this armoring up that is required to claim my own choices. And it's just, it's, it's heroic to somehow, I mean, and we're not talking about sort of getting good at it. We're talking about brutal confrontation with yourself and coming to a place where I am no longer going to be disrespected and I will go to silence and I will hold to the silence. And I don't care if I get an eight inch long text whining about how somebody else is hurt because of my actions. No, you know, so that's one thing. And then to actually meet somebody who, and to be in a healthy relationship with a woman and her to gently and kindly ask me, like, can I comment on something, you know, that I'm noticing? Um, are you open to some reflection? I love like, that. All right. You know, and she says to me, she goes, you know, it's not the flirting that bothers me. It's that you're unconscious of your need to be validated by the feminine. Wow. Like, <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, she, she just said, it's, I can feel it. And I said, all right, let me, let me wander around for a couple of weeks and I will watch myself <laughs> and I will see if I do that shit. And so I do. And after two weeks, I come back to her and said, you know what? You're totally right. I, I, know, I mean, to... what a conscious relationship. That's amazing. Right. right. And, and But the beauty of it is she, she goes, you know, it's not the flirting that bothers me. <laughs> You're unconscious of it. And what you're doing is showing people how to manipulate you. Oh, my God, no. Is that lady a therapist? Yeah. Well, she's got a whole following. She's got a whole big deal going on now. And, and it's she's really successful. She's but, amazing. Yeah. So she says she says it's 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 the same in business. So if you need to be validated by somebody you're basically showing them how to feed you candy and they will lead you off in a different direction and that's what scares me and i'm like oh my god i just wanted to take her into the bedroom and like thank her in no uncertain terms for making me aware of that and you just stop you're just you don't realize that you're just in a weak place where you're not conscious of this need and to turn that around, and, and it's not like I need to stop flirting. It's that now I'm aware of I like being entertained. I like entertaining people, but I'm not 
open to this manipulation. So it's lessons like that, that you slowly kind of come to grips with your own operating system that allows you to really make better choices. I love that. I think I, do I want her as my best friend or not? <laughs> that is the question. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm fascinated by that because I, I absolutely, I'm very sensitive and I can pick stuff up. And one thing that still I would say triggers me is when I feel like someone is trying to manipulate me, but that right. just feels so conscious and so like dig that up by the roots and chuck it away, eh? <laughs> yep. Yeah, and then there was another story that comes to mind is um, the same woman, uh, when I first started dating her, uh, there was like an overlap with another woman I was dating and I, I handled it poorly and I ended up getting all butt hurt and I had to go home for a couple of days and she finally called me and said, look, just come over, you know, just come over, let's talk. And all right. So I get over there and she says to me, she says, I don't know if you need that much drama in your relationship to feel yourself, but I don't do that kind of drama. And I go, well, what do you do? She goes, what I do is I express what would make me feel more comfortable. And then I watch what you do. Oh. And I, connect, I collect data. And with that data, I make choices. And my choices will affect your reality faster than any amount of my trying to manipulate you and to get you to do what I want you to do. And I'm, I mean, I'm, there I'm again. sorry. Damn, woman. You know? Is that like, the new word or is that the new? Say that again. <laughs> Let's just live like that. You know, Absolutely. I'm with a woman that knows how to make a choice and she can follow through on her choice. And so like th that was a huge theme. There's just so much noise of people who are winding up trying to like make something happen when all they really are is afraid to make a choice. Oh, unbelievable. She should be the queen of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's amazing. I'm I'm blown away. I'm, I thought I was quite aware and conscious. Right. So you take those little lessons and then you start looking to, on your own to like what other lessons I can I teach my teach myself. Yeah. And one I that see, I when I yeah. yeah. So for myself, I I started really riffing on this notion of ask for what you want and then shut up. Yes. And so the and shut up part is allow somebody else to have an experience with your request. Because so many people, before they ask for something, there's a calculation. There's the calculation of how entitled am I to get what I'm asking for already before I even ask for it? Or, you know, what's my self-worth? Or do I think they owe it to me? Or do, have I done enough to justify it? Or, you know, yeah. so there's all of this that's going on on my side that clouds the exchange. Yeah. So if I just ask and I trust that they will make the choice that's best for the situation, it's just, there's so much space opens yeah. up, right? I and it doesn't that matter well. what their answer is. Even if they say no, it's like, thank exactly. you for taking care of yourself. So if to live your life at that level of integrity, yeah. Everything I build my life from is something that's given freely. Yeah. And then I'm just clean. Everything's clean. So my inner peace, my temple is pristine and it's quiet. So when I can be present with somebody like you, Jerry, the, you know, the intimacy just goes to 100%. Mm. Because there's nobody here but you and I. Yeah. Beautiful. I love that. So that's the way I live my life. It's, and then everything else is just candy. It's a respect for, and, a, and what I took from that is it's, it's a, a knowing and a respect for the field, the field of all possibilities. Yeah. Right. Put it out there. And... Yeah. And if it was meant to happen, it'll happen. You know, it's yeah. for something that, you know, was, it was meant to be it will find you or, you know, if there's a relationship that's warming up, if, if you're wondering if they care or not, or if it's really real, it'll, it'll happen regardless. Yeah. I mean, you can't fuck it up actually. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a certain calm in that, like 
if something is circling me, just relax because I can't fuck it up if it wants to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the other side of that is then when people say, oh, it wasn't meant to be. <laughs> That's something I, I um, yeah, I find very interesting. Yeah, you know, and then it comes down to the question of what are you willing to fight for? Exactly. But fighting, I, you know, it's not so much fighting for anything, yeah. but just being clear. Being clear, but also there's an element of using your will to create what your heart loves. Because mm -hmm. when there's something that you want to manifest or create, and it's directly connected with your heart rather than the ego, you know, something that your heart really loves, then it's going to be connected with your wound as well. So yeah, it takes the will to, to take. And all we need to do is take those baby steps. It's not like, you know, some big thing. It's just one, one baby step after another. Well, it's like being a ballet dancer, right? I mean, that's, that's connected to your heart. That's your life purpose. And if it's yeah. painful to practice and practice and practice and practice, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's, you know, devastating sometimes to go through or a director that's just a total, you know, like hard person to deal with. But there comes the moment when everything's working and you're on stage and a light comes up and, and, and you get to practice what you've dreamed of. Mm. So it's worth it. Yeah. No, oh my no gosh. It is. It is. Um, I'm just getting this real sense that it's, it can be effortless as well. You know, when Absolutely. it's when it's when it's your truth. And I know, you know, one of the things that you were sharing with me was about being truthful is is actually or can be as simple as sharing information about uh, uh, you know with others. Um and I'm curious to know a little bit more about that in just in terms of controlling it or filtering it. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, the whole like controlling things. Like, for example, like uh, the, just just getting into a relationship, the level of um, uh, wanting to control things so the outcome will be in your benefit or whatever, it's exhausting. And it, and it, and it, it turns too much of the attention on the, ex like the exchange of the, um, you know, the you and me, as opposed to the space that I can create. And the, the way to create space is the metaphor I use is if I want to be honest with you, obviously, if we if I share what I know, we both have the same information and you can do what you want with that information. And it's none of my business to try to shape it or modify it or control it to increase you know, your perception of me or whatever. It's just to always be transparent especially with things that are, that involve other people. I mean, there's people that I could, I could do something and apologize for it later. I, and I can also let somebody know, Hey, you know, uh, I'm about to do something that may affect you. Here's how it would go. So there's this level of integrity that allows others to, you know, elect to be near me because they want to. And, and there's, I'm telling you, like the, the, the skill of creating space is really underrated as far as how attractive it is. And my metaphor for that is if, if my, if the who I am is just this big old oak tree and I want to attract somebody, well, I'm going to build this nest in my oak tree that's decorated with things that I know this other person is interested in and they can come sit in it anytime they want and they can leave anytime they want. And my job is just to plain old be present when they decide to sit in it. And it's just spacious and free. So there's no doors and walls and obligations. There's no, you know what I mean? It, it, it's just. I love that. Uh, it's just I so easy. It. It, it reminds me of someone I discovered recently, an incredible business mentor called Scott Oldford. And he has this method called the ROI method, which is relevance, omnipresence, and intimacy. Great. Um, yeah, which, which I love. It's something that he created. 
Uh, yeah, I, I adore that. I adore that. Yeah, I mean, you you exude inner peace. Thank you. You exude many things, but most definitely that. And that, as soon as that's what the interview is all about. Um, I mean, I'm curious. I want to ask you about how you maintain that. You know, because I think you've got you've built a very powerful, beautiful inner temple. But maybe first, I'd love to know what drove you to that. Because you talk about being an overachiever in the past and everything. Did you have to hit a wall to realize the importance of this? And how do you maintain it? All right. So here's a funny story. So I'm like, you know, mid midlife. I'm a professional engineer at a major corporation, and uh, you know, a job promotion comes up and I might be a candidate for it. So instead of asking my boss if I'm a candidate for it, I just overachieved to a point where all the guys in my team are like, Hoffman, just play in the sandbox. Jeez, you know, relax. And it wasn't until I started going to snuggle parties and there's the orientation at the beginning of the snuggle party where you say, can I touch you on the shoulder? And somebody says, oh, I'd rather you didn't. And then you say, thank you for taking care of yourself. So I, I, it was the first time that I learned that you can actually ask for something and nobody died. You know, there's this vulnerability of even putting yourself into a position where somebody can say no, because you're terrified of what might happen if they do. But to exercise that muscle and then finally realize, you know, I can ask for what I want. Somebody else can tell me their perspective and that's their perspective. And it has nothing to do with me. It's just the situation that they're managing. So there's yeah. this level of a disc, it's just trying not to control everything. And then, I don't know, it just, um, it just becomes a way of life to just walk in this piece where I'm in control. I think um, to answer your other question about what's my inner temple look like, I have this, um, fierce protective spirit of, of keeping my peace and the way I describe it is if there's any clutter in my space, I either put it in a drawer underneath my altar for safekeeping, or I take it out in the backyard and burn it in a bonfire. And it's one or the other. There is no, I owe somebody an answer or an apology, but I don't want to get around to it today. Or is that my stuff? Or, do, you know, do I have some guilt around something where I, I only can ask for half of it and I I'm too afraid to ask for all of it because there's too much shame. All of that noise, just you eventually just abandon it and you just become this quiet, resourceful person. And the way I, I, des I would describe the, the culmination of that, I had this happen the other day. I'm standing, waiting for my morning coffee. The barista's making my coffee and I'm just standing there in this level of peace and stillness. I'm just standing in a coffee shop and I feel like I'm standing on the surface of the moon. And the way that I feel is I know that I can act. I know that I can jump up from a chair in acting improv class. I can chop a cord of wood. I can pull my friend out from the path of a swerving car. I can instantly act anytime. I know it in my bones, but in the moment I'm standing there waiting for my coffee, I don't have to. And so there's just this knowing of my resources and my capability. And I don't have to, I don't owe anybody anything. And I'm, I love that feeling of just space. So no matter what I'm building in the, in the middle of or worrying about or like all the cash I got to spend on some tooling or whatever, that noise doesn't follow me around. I just stand in my peace. And from that space, the human nature that you described, you know, millions of years of evolution is in full, you know, openness. So I just rely on my instinctual human nature to make my choices because I'm just like in it. So yeah. you can't go wrong. No, exactly. There's a few times when you've been speaking that the phrase creating art for art's sake. I don't know, is that an Oscar Wilde quotation or someone? But that just feels so powerful. And 
that's not that you can really rate art on a good, bad, you know, polarize it, whatever, but it's going to be art from the heart, isn't it? Yeah, because we get to choose what we want to do. And if we want to do something bold, do something bold. Like this, yeah. this, this wristband thing that I'm working on. I mean, I've been doing this for a year and a half and it's, and it's laying down like really thin layers of sediment, like to build the technology and find my software guy. And he's been working on it for a year and doing all the prototypes and then doing wow. festivals and shooting all the videos and getting my TikTok traffic up and getting my Instagram traffic up. And just, it's just every day is another, what am I going to do today that advances my cause? It's nonstop. And just recently I had to get a side hustle job just to kind of pay for it. So I, I took a job as a matchmaker. I'm a sales guy at a matchmaking office, you know, like connecting people up. It was fascinating. Like wow. the nice nature that you'd sit across from. I loved it. And then, I bet you're amazing at it as well. So, you know, I just like slowly, slowly, slowly with a tremendous amount of patience. And a lot of times you realize, you know, I'm actually glad I didn't end up with 10 grand a month ago. I would have done something different. And I'm glad that didn't happen because I'm in a stronger position right now. Yeah. So, you know, there's this, and, and it doesn't have to go any faster because the pace that it's going is so alive that what else would I want to do? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Christopher, most of the women, uh, most of the people that listen to my podcast and watch, you know, the summits and YouTube and everything are women. Um, what, because I, 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 I don't normally ask this of men, but I just feel your heart and I just feel your authenticity and connection. Um, what message have you got for women, maybe related to creation of Ecuador or just in general? Um. That's a great question. Boy, that's a, that's a huge opportunity to say something meaningful. Um, I think that for women to stand up for themselves, like what would they stand up for that would be meaningful with men? And, and, and to say something that could shift men in, in a short amount of time and actually, it's, it's being a dude, there's, there's times when I go into a conversation with a woman and if and if I sense that she's not in charge of her own self agency, I can just talk my way around her and get what I want anyways. And it's kind of a disappointment. And, but for a woman to stand in front of me, and go like, Oh, wait a minute, dude, I saw that. That actually is not okay with me. Or, or can you say that a different way? Or, you know, there's this, I want to lock horns a little bit, you know, with yeah. a woman on you know like what i'm trying to get away with because that's what we do yeah <laughs> so, and so there's this and then there's this certain amount of like entitlement that dudes just walk around with with women like they believe that they get to have women's attention and it's it's so it, like there's an exchange that starts to happen that just it starts to focus on the relationship so what i what i try to do is 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 talk about creating space as an invitation for women to step into and for women to ask a dude. And this is, it's funny. Um, I had another one say to me, so many guys say things that are actually not an invitation and, and women get good. She, she was telling me she's gotten good at, can you rephrase that? So it's actually an invitation that I can step into and not have to do anything. Because until you can open something up and say, here, I would love it if you stepped into this. This is what it looks like, and it would be awesome. And all she has to do is step into it and make it gorgeous. I mean, that's an invitation. Oh, my God, so, that's poetic. Yeah, go on. As a woman, I would, I, would, I would make sure that you're getting invitations to step into things as you know, if you want to stay in your feminine role, I mean, same thing with like paying for dinner. Like I always pay, not because I want to do somebody a favor because I want to show that dinners, that the kind of money is not a lot of money to me. That's all. I mean, I've, I've got resources. So dinner is like, I'll take care of it, you know? So 
The same thing with opening a car door. And I'm not opening a car door to do you a favor. I'm opening the car door because it proves that I'm not in a hurry. Oh, it slows yeah. the whole energy down. And, and the way you open the door and the way you wait until somebody sits down and swings their legs in and looks up at you and smiles and you click the door and then you calmly walk around the car and you get in the car and you look over and you just say something like, I'm having a fucking awesome time. Oh, oh I love it. You're going to no, get so many women ask me for dates <laughs> after this. <laughs> It's like, again, it's like the presence that you can bring yeah. that a woman can relax into because they're terrified most of the time. They're, they're constantly managing like, all right, what did that mean? All right, that was an indicator. That was a red flag. Was that a red flag? You know, like the minute you can get all that to just calm down with a woman Enjoy. for five fucking minutes, you know, you're already way ahead of most of the days. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So that's that. just creating space. And I'm not trying to be like in charge or want women to be submissive or anything. Like I think women are running way more than anybody really understands. Like even in the middle of sexuality, women are running the encounter. And what, what, what for me, the way I look at it is I'm moving forward. I've got ideas and if my ideas are great ideas, she's allowing them to happen. And if it's seamless and there's really no pushback and I don't even get a tap on my hips while I'm doing what I'm doing, we're rocking it. Yeah. But she's allowing every single thing to happen. And the more I respect the fact that that's actually what's in play, the more I'm aware of what the exchange is. Yeah. Yeah. So That's it's there's some basic yeah. stuff that once you get that figured out, you know, people can play in some really expansive ways and it gets really fun. Yeah. And everyone being in their power as well. Totally. I love it. It's been amazing. Oh. We're nearly, we're, we're I've come to the, the final few questions that I ask everyone about creating a life they adore. Um, what do you think the three ingredients are to create a life you adore. And actually, first of all, what, 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 because a life I adore is different for everyone. Um, what does it mean to you? And what are the three things that you feel are important to have? You know, I think, I think the way I would answer that is um, the acquisition of stuff um, yeah. as a goal is great. I mean, I'm on, I'm on a road right now. I want to, I want to make a lot of cash so I can redistribute cash and do classes for schools and do my own festivals and stuff like that. But it's not about, you know, hoarding cash. It's about having resources. So, but in the middle of whatever you've got that you're um, the custodian of, there has to be some inner peace that allows me to breathe and to go to my yoga class and, and drop into my nothingness and to find some life partner that is your, um, you know, your, your mirror and your reflection and somebody to push against. And, you know, to me, that's kind of like the backbone of my life is to make sure that I get up every day and I want to be up and I want to be doing what I'm doing and I can prioritize what I want to do. And then it's just, can I trick this thing into happening? <laughs> can I, you know, be a court jester enough to attract some people to believe in what I'm doing and then actually do the thing that I'm say I'm going to do in small enough steps where there's such consistency that they choose to show up. And so that's the game. It's just it's this active, frothy, collaborative game that I think translates back to human nature and like human survival. Because we all have to have those skills to share, you know, the you know the life experience of just surviving on this planet. So let's mm. make it fun. Oh yeah, I'm all for the fun. Yeah, I love it. And you, that leads beautifully into my next question, which is. If there were no limits, 
some people say there are no limits, but if there were no limits, what is a world that you adore like and how are we going to create that in this no limits world? New world. That's a great, that's a great answer. Um, I will, I will, um, I'll take a crack at it. So for example, technology, I'm a huge, huge technology engineer guy following technology for whatever. Like, so you, but you look at a company like Tesla and Elon Musk, and he's a guy who's to me, he's a, he's a total con man. And there's nothing about saving the planet or eco anything in it. It's just, it's just an extortion and a big play and the electric car for rich people. And there, you know, where is the $1,500 car that a single mother needs to drive her kids to school? You know, until we get to- Great point. Right, you know? Go I mean, <laughs> Like urban transportation, you know, it's all about parking. There's 30% of the cars are driving around in the city any given time trying to park. So why don't we have high-speed parking? Or why don't we have more shuttle buses? Or, you know, there's this, like who's, where is the office at the federal level of like, let's not do stupid shit. It's just, it's just so completely devoid of any strategy that has like, where's our 10 year plan? Where's our 50 year plan? Oh, where is the thousand year plan for what we're doing on this planet? Nobody Ugh. is thinking on that level. So until we start thinking that way, we're all kind of creating our own little support systems and our own little like off the grid communities, which is fine, but I, that's where my head goes. I'm just blown away. That was meant to be the last question, but I'm not letting you go. Um, I, I, and about that, you just blow my mind because even though I ask myself those questions and all sorts, um, I, I just love that. It's true. You know, it's it's so basic. So this is a this is a question from my inner child. <laughs> because you seem so good at answering all of these questions. Why I'm are correct. we letting the big baddies, the you might say the governments or the whoever, why are we letting them get away the creation of world that none of us really want? No, I know. I know. Like it's almost like stop giving them money. And, and they're irrelevant right now. I mean, the government is totally irrelevant. I mean, really. I mean, there's so much that could be, half of it could get recreated with a great app and a following and some investor cash. I mean, I think that's, it's literally, if, if we do it right, the entire human race is just gonna figure its own self out and government can just go just dissolve. I don't know if that's possible, but I don't know. It's, that's big thinking. Yeah. Oh my God, it's been so much fun. Christopher, thank you so much for your time. We ran quite long, but I, I, I couldn't let you go. <laughs> I'm not letting you go. <laughs> and you are the one that talked about space. So we've created a lot of space. And we did. To everyone that's listening or if you're watching, thank you so much for joining us. And I believe you have a gift for everyone. Would you like to? Tell us a little yeah, bit about you know what I did? I've, I've been selling my book for years. It's rave reviews on Amazon. It's called Heart in Gear, an Engineer's Erotic Journey to Freedom. It's a beautiful book. And I decided, you know, I'm just going to take the PDF of the book and put it up for free. So this is the first time I've actually let it out into the wild. You can do whatever you want with it. I've, therapists have actually used it for textbooks. I mean, it's, it's really, it needs to be out. And for your women, I mean, it's a great story of a dude figuring himself out. So wow. I would encourage everybody. It's a, and, and don't even pick it up unless you're ready to sit down for 10 hours and do a straight read through because that's what really? happens I can put it down. Really? My God, that's a great book then. Okay, thank you. That'll be in the show notes and people who have access to that free. Christopher, again, I can't thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. It's been amazing and a joy and a pleasure. And Thank you. Have an amazing Great. rest of day. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> Jerry. Bye, bye. -bye.